<laughs> oh, coming so many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's good. Yeah, it's good to be formal. Uh, so, so feel free to interrupt me during the talk as well. I mean, if anything would be unclear. Um, so I, I chose this topic for today's talk specifically because of this work in progress. Uh, and so I'd really be interested in hearing your thoughts on this topic. You know, all comments, ideas, suggestions are very much welcome. Um, and so, yeah, even though my arguments that I'm going to present here today are, are bound to be relatively rough around the edges, I, I hope they will be clear and controversial enough to fuel the discussion uh, <laughs> later on. Uh, and we have some ideas here, especially the latest ideas that I'm going to defend, uh, that are pretty wild. And so, um, yeah. So I thought before before starting the talk, it, it, it may be helpful to. One second, I'm going to kill your clicker for a moment. Sorry, the camera's going very weird. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> That's okay. It's totally washing out the slides. I've been having trouble with cameras lately. I had the same problem with Teams not too long ago. Where's the exposure? Now reactivated. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good yeah, to go. you're good. Sorry. All right. So, so, so let me just briefly start by saying how this talk fits within what I hope is going to become a much larger project. Yeah. Um, so the larger project would be to explore the relationship between the different ontologies of time and the various metaphysics of laws. Yeah. Uh, now, as you can see. When you consider the different ontologies of time, there's basically two camps. You have um, the open future ontologies that take the future to be open in the sense that the future doesn't yet exist. The future comes into existence as time passes. And then you have the closed future ontologies, which on the other hand say that uh, the, the future is already out there. It's already part of our ontology. And so it is closed in that sense. Now, when you consider the different metaphysical accounts of laws, you can distinguish between the Humean and the non Humean accounts. <coughs> so, on the Humean accounts, the laws of nature merely describe how nature is, whereas on a non Humean account, the laws of nature don't just describe, they actually prescribe how nature should behave. Yeah. Um, and I'll say a few more things about, about the different ontologies of metaphysics in just a moment. But so, the question here would be, are the ontologies of time and the different metaphysics of laws somehow related? So suppose I want to subscribe to an open future ontology of time. Does that fact force me somehow to adopt either a humane or a non-humane account about laws? Or if I am somehow driven by non-humane convictions, does that force me to adopt one or the other ontology of time? That's the question I want to explore. Um, it's a simple question, but it's surprisingly underexplored in the philosophical literature. Um, good. Now, before I get to, to the actual talk, just a few more words about these ontologies of time. Are you familiar with the ontologies of time, more or less? I'll go quick. Yeah. So, um, considering the open future ontologies, you have either the presentist or the growing blocker. So, according to the presentist, only the present moment exists. The past no longer exists, the future does not yet exist. The growing blocker leader had to claim that both past and present events exist. Yeah. But they both agree that the future doesn't exist yet. Yeah. Uh, so they both deny the existence of the future, and I will therefore call them future deniers. The eternalist, on the other hand, will claim that past, present, and future events are somehow equally real. They're ontologically on a par. Basically, they, are, they, 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 they lie frozen in this four-dimensional block universe. Mm -hmm. um, and the moving spotlighter is somewhat of an eternalist, but who wants to make sense of the passage of time, and so has this spotlight shining on the now, which moves as time flows. Um, but again, both of those would agree that the future exists. So I will call them the future acceptors. 
Then very quickly moving through the, the two accounts of laws of nature. So on the Hume account, as I said, the laws of nature are merely descriptive. That they describe the way the world is. And so if you look at the philosophical literature, you'll find people saying that uh, they reflect the way things are. They're just convenient summaries. They're accurate reports. Basically, the world just is. And the laws are the result of humankind's attempt to understand that world. Yeah. Um, on the non humane account of laws, the laws of nature are prescriptive, and so they are taken to govern the world. So you'll find statements like uh, they determine the distribution of matter and energy, they govern the evolution of the universe, they control, they rule, they have causal powers, they dictate, they produce the events of the world, they drive the world, basically, they tell nature what to do. Yeah, or, in a nutshell, what a law says must happen, and what a law forbids cannot happen. That's the non um view of laws. And so when you compare these two very different accounts of laws of nature, uh, I think it's pretty clear that on the descriptive view, there are no necessary connections between events. And as such, everything in this Humean mosaic of events is, is taken to be contingent. Whereas on the prescriptive view, uh, there are these necessary connections over and above the Humean mosaic of events. And it is due to those necessary connections that somehow everything is necessitated. Yeah. Um, what is more, so on the descriptive view, we, we, we somehow infer what the laws are from the way the human mosaic is, from the way nature is. Whereas on the prescriptive view, it's, it's just the other way around. In that case, we will infer the way nature is from what the laws of nature are. Yeah. And so I think you can, you can feel that the descriptive view um, on that view, the laws of nature are rather passive and static, whereas on the prescriptive view, the laws of nature are very active and, and, and dynamic. They are the things that, that, that govern the evolution of the universe and tell the particles how to move in what direction at what time. Um, and so given, given those distinctions, at least intuitively, I would say that the descriptive view seems to fit rather well with a closed future ontology. What you want is, is the entire human mosaic of events, and it's the entire block universe, four-dimensional block universe, from which to infer the different rules of nature, yeah? from which to observe the different patterns and regularities. Whereas the prescriptive view, where the laws are actually governing the world, telling the particles how to move the next instant of time, that seems to fit much better with an open future ontology, in which the future does not yet exist, but comes into existence as time passes, and as, as by which the laws can actually do some active, productive role. Yeah. Um, so I, I, want, I want to come up with some arguments for these kind of intuitions. And interestingly enough, the, the, the last claim here has recently been challenged in, in a paper by Lisa Weininger called The Coordination is Going to Be. Yeah, I have a quick, yeah, quick sure. question sure, sure. about the previous slide. I just wonder why the descriptive view would see law of nature as Passive and statics, I mean, we could, mm -hmm. uh, we could say, for instance, there is no such a thing as law, you know, but the world itself exists, it's a block uh, concept yeah. of time, and we, as humans, we try to interfere some correlation, maybe. Mm -hmm. In that case, law wouldn't be passive and static. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, 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 I agree. I, I think I know what you want to say. So. On that picture, laws are just summaries. It's not as if there are laws in nature that, that somehow govern the way nature evolves. And so in that sense... Yes, summaries, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Indeed, indeed. So I agree. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the picture I have in mind. Yeah. Uh, but given that picture, I think that seems to fit very well with an eternalist outlook of time. Mm -hmm. um, but indeed, I see that best of instead may not be the, the best term for that. Um, in any case, it's, 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 the, it's the letter claim here that the prescriptive view requires an open future ontology that has been challenged in this paper by Lisa Leininger. And so my talk today would actually be a reply to Leininger's paper. Um, so, so, I mean, not only is it, is it one of the few papers that I've said that, that actually explores this relationship between the ontologies of time and the metaphysics of laws, it also contains a beautifully simple yeah, and at first sight very convincing argument against this idea of absolute becoming. Yeah? That is against the idea that the future doesn't exist right now and that the future comes into existence with the passage of time. Um, good. 
So let me just quickly go over the Meininger's argument against the future deniers. Um, so in her paper, Leininger claims that the future deniers, yeah, whether they are presentist or growing blocker, they will all face a serious metaphysical problem. Yeah? So according to her, the problem is the following. Um, first of all, the world seems to be a regular place. Yeah? So simply put, uh, there are universal generalizations of the form all Fs are Gs. Yeah? Um, all electrons are negatively charged, all humans are mortal, uh, all metals expand when heated, etc. Uh, but what is more, and this, this fact only applies to the future denier, who doesn't think the future to exist, as that future comes into existence because of absolute becoming, the world remains regular. Yeah? And so it seems that whatever comes into existence is, is somehow coordinated with what came before, such that these universal generalizations continue to be realized. Yeah. Uh, so not only do you see those, those past and present regularities where all Fs are Gs, but as the future comes into existence, all Fs will remain Gs. Yeah. Now, I will call this the continuing regularity assumption. Yeah. And given this continuing regularity assumption, According to Leininger, future deniers are facing what she calls the coordination problem. That is, how to explain the continuing regularity of the world. Yeah? Why do those past and present regularities persist in the future when the future comes into existence? That's the challenge for the future denier. Yeah? Now, a relatively straightforward and standard way of answering this question is by appealing to enforcers, yeah, such as causation, rules of nature, or dispositions, yeah, to, to guarantee that whatever comes into existence will preserve those past and present regularities. Yeah. And so typically, those enforcers will constrain what comes into existence by introducing some kind of necessary connection, yeah, you could call it NFG, between present states of affairs, F, and future states of affairs in G. Yeah. Such that if F presently occurs, then necessarily G will have to follow in the future as the future comes into existence. Yeah. That's the idea. Now, according to Leininger, um, in a world with no future, these enforcers are actually powerless, and so they cannot guarantee future regularity. Yeah? That is, um, NFG here, this necessary connection, cannot ensure that G will always follow F. Yeah? And the reason for this is actually very simple. So um, if F happens presently, if F happens in the present, then, then G will be in the future. And so G does not exist for the future denier. However, for the necessary connection NFG here to exist, both F and G need to exist. So this is the idea that relations are existence and tailing. Yeah? A relation can only exist if both of its relata exist. Um, to give you an example, um, I am standing in front of you. Clearly, both you and I need to exist in order for that relation between the two of us to hold true. So the same applies here. And so as long as G here does not exist, NFG cannot exist. And so N NFG cannot be used to necessitate G into existence. Yeah. Uh, now I feel like the debate is about what does it mean to exist more than what does it mean uh, future um, uh, necessitation. You know, because for instance, let's say I am a uh, looker and I, don't, I, I, I deny the future, but I, I can state that uh, epistemologically the concept exists, so I can speak about what will come tomorrow, but the, the existence has to be tough in another way, ontological, you know. And so I won't say why that would be an objection. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going, I, I think I'm going to come to some of the points you're just raising in just a bit, so, so bear with me just for a few more slides. Um, but of course, the problem here is a metaphysical one. Yeah? So even if epistemologically you could make sense of all of this, the fact is that metaphysically, according to future deniers, 
those future events, even if they will come into existence, do not yet exist, so you don't have them as a resource in order to make sense of these necessary relations. Yes. Okay, so, uh, and I have another point uh, about uh, the um, uh, relation between uh, sorry, about the fact that the exist about the existence of the relationship implying the existence of the relata, because I'd say that it depends on the relationship because. Uh, if I say uh, the liver produces insulin, at, uh, but this relation uh, doesn't necessitate the existence of uh, the liver and insulin yeah. at the same uh, time point. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, again, I'll come back to that as well. <laughs> That's definitely one of the things which you can do in order to challenge um, yeah. her, her coordination problem here. You could, you could challenge the fact that relations that already, at least in this case, the necessary relations here have to be existence and tailing. Yeah. So that would be one way of trying to respond to this. So I'll, I'll come back to this also in a few slides. I'm just yeah. just follow up with the same idea, but we can say the same with the mathematical object. Sure. Yeah, indeed. It doesn't mean that exists. I mean it depends how you define it. And, and absolutely it. one one of the key discussions here is going to be what yeah. do we mean by exist, yeah, what yeah, do we mean by real. So a lot of this uh, yeah so so yeah, are you quickly getting into relatively deep metaphysical waters here. Um, but I think the argument is clear enough, yeah. uh, even, even if there are hopefully a lot of ways out. Uh, that's the argument. So according to Leininger, that shows you that uh, the future deniers must be wrong. Yeah? Um, so, so yeah, the, 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 the future doesn't come into existence. There is no absolute becoming. Um, there isn't some kind of ontological shift in which the unreal future somehow becomes real in the present. No, the future must exist if you want to make sense of this continuing regularity. Um, and so eternalism, according to Leininger, must be the correct ontology of time. Yeah. Now, even though I myself am, am much more inclined towards eternalist conceptions of time, I don't agree with her argument. And so my reply here today will be twofold. Yeah. And some of the, the, the points I'm going to say will, will probably fit nicely with what you just, with what you just raised. Um, so I'm going to argue that the future deniers can either avoid the coordination problem altogether by rejecting this continuing regularity assumption, or the future denier can answer the coordination problem by distinguishing time from token level necessitation. Yeah. Uh, but so let me start with the first kind of reply. Um, so notice that in her paper, Leininger simply assumes the continuing regularity of the world. Yeah. And she then very rightly so demands an explanation for this fact, which she dubs the coordination problem, and which she then argues no future denier can successfully answer. Yeah. But notice that a Humean could very easily reject this continuing regularity assumption. Yeah. That is, even if the uh, even if the world has been regular so far, and it is up till the present moment, there is nothing on the human picture that requires the world to remain regular in the future. And the reason, as I said, is that on the human view, there are no necessary connections between events. Or as Hume said, all events seem entirely loose and separate. And so what it means is that the world does not have to be the way it is by some kind of necessity, it, it just is. Yeah. All efforts do not have to be genes by necessity, it just happens to be the case that so far all efforts have been genes. Yeah. And so in other words, this regular constant conjunction of efforts and genes in the human mosaic of events, at least up to the present moment, is a complete fluke, it's a cosmic coincidence. Yeah. And so without um, necessary connections, without these little arrows here linking the Fs to the Gs, nothing on the human picture guarantees that the Fs would remain Gs in the future. That is, the past and present regularities here may not persist in the future, contra Leininger's continuing regularity assumption. The question, however, remains whether a future denier can appeal to this kind of human response in order to, to avoid the coordination problem, yeah? by just rejecting the idea that the world has to remain regular in the future. 
Um, that is, to put it more precisely, can one combine an open future ontology of time, such as presentism or growing rockism, with a Humean metaphysic? And I think at first sight, the answer may actually turn out to be no. I mean, following the late David Lewis, most Humeans today are eternalists. Yeah? They take the Humean mosaic of events to be the static four-dimensional space-time block of past, present, and future events. So they all subscribe to a closed future ontology. Um, but interestingly enough, there, there is an alternative on the philosophical market, uh, which is supposed to be compatible with an open future ontology, and is therefore called open future humanism. Um, now, as you can see on, on the picture here, open future humanism is typically linked to growing block theories of time. Yeah. Because in that case, the growing block here still affords us with a dynamic four-dimensional block of past and present events from which to infer the human laws of nature. Uh, so, so far, so good for the growing blocker. Yeah. Um, but what about the, the presentist? Yeah. Could a presentist who, remember, has only access to present facts, could a presentist be a open future human? Yeah. Um, is a, a three-dimensional slice of present events enough? Now, it isn't. According to Christy Miller, um, we cannot extract human laws from the present moment alone. Yeah. We need access to the entire mosaic of facts in order to determine the appropriate systematization of those facts. Smart in more recent papers said presentism is ill-suited to human conceptions since the presentist thesis provides only a very small supervenience base for the laws of nature to supervene upon. So the situation looks much more bleak for the presentist, but, but, but I beg to differ with Miller and Smart. Um, and, and my reason for doing so is the following. Um, consider any past tense statement such as dinosaurs did exist. Um, now, trying to account for the truth of this past tense statement is a relatively straightforward matter for the eternalist, for whom both past, present, and future events exist. And so the eternalist can just look at those past events, such as dinosaurs roaming planet Earth, uh, and can make them act as truth makers for those past tense statements. But for the presentist, for whom the past no longer exists, those past events are no longer available to act as truth makers. So this is, of course, known as a truth maker problem. It's a very well known, it's a very serious problem for the presentist. Um, but it has, of course, been extensively studied. And so uh, the presentist has come up with a variety of answers to the truth maker problem in order to make sense of these past tense statements. Yeah. Whether this is going to be in terms of tensed properties, or tensed facts, or God's memory, or traces, or the laws of nature, or exat times, um, it's not of my concern today, but, but insofar as the present is able to provide an answer to the truth maker problem, I don't see any reason why the presentist couldn't include these past and statements as facts describing how the human mosaic was like in the past, thereby enlarging her supervenience base for the human laws to, um, to supervene upon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I agree with you, because my question is, even if I'm a presentist, I won't deny that presently I have a memory of the past. Maybe this memory is true. Maybe we can take it for yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Future knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I, I think I think the truth making problem is serious, and and, and, I, and I don't think all of the the the, the, the stretches that have been proposed to solve it are, are are very are very successful. But there definitely are ways of, of making sense of this problem, uh, which would help us here as well to be in all the future human. And so I would I would um, argue that all future deniers, therefore, not only the growing blocker but also the presentist can endorse open future humanism as a way out of the coordination problem by just rejecting the idea that the future has to remain regular, um, uh, that the world has to be regular in the, in the future. Good. Yeah, I have another question about yeah. present. Maybe a more stronger objection would be that uh, okay, present doesn't exist uh, yet. I mean, if you want to make a relationship into the present, the problem is that once you start saying something, 
it's already in the past. So maybe that won't be a better argument. I don't know if it, if, if it exists in the literature. It, it, there, it seems like you know? Yeah, uh, there, is, there is, of course, I mean, uh, even, even when you look at presentism, you'll see that presentism has become very much of an umbrella term for all kinds of different accounts of, of, of uh, ontologies of time. So you have hypercone uh, presentism, uh, hyperplane presentists, you have uh, point presentists, and, and you will have, for example, presentists who take the present not to be this, this very thin three-dimensional slice, but will take it to have a certain, certain yeah, yeah. extension yeah, time as question. well. So yeah. oh, otherwise, yeah. the question yeah. even doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. And sure, and you can see how that would help to, to resolve a lot of potential problems for the presentist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but I want to move to my second reply, which, which in a sense is going to be much more substantial. Um, so, so imagine that the future denier does not want to subscribe to some form of humanism. Yeah? Imagine the future denier is driven by non-human convictions. Uh, in that case, the solution I just, I just proposed is no longer available to the future denier. So the future denier will have to come up with an answer to the coordination problem. That is, how to explain the continuing regularity of the world. Yeah. Um, and now, although Leininger actually nowhere makes it really explicit in her paper, I'm going to argue that her coordination problem is just another variation of, um, of a much more general and well-known problem, namely the problem of cross-temporal relations. Yeah? And so the problem, the problem of cross-temporal relations very briefly goes as follows. So premise one says, Relations require the existence of their relata. Yeah? We just discussed this. This is the idea that all relations are existence and tailing. Premise 2 says some relations are cross temporal yeah? uh, and they therefore hold between present and non present events. Yeah? So, given premise 2 and premise 1, if there is such a thing as a cross temporal relation that holds between present and non present events, and if both relata need to exist for the relation to exist, then clearly uh, non-present events must exist. Yeah. Now, to give you some examples of cross-temporal relations, um, you have precedence relations, such as Newton's bird is earlier than Einstein's. Um, comparative relations, such as I am taller now than Einstein was in the past. Uh, or just causal relations. Yeah? Yesterday's storm caused today's flood. All of those are cross-temporal relations. But consider now premise four. If presentism is true, then non-present events do not exist. Yeah? Uh, indeed, according to the presentist credo, necessarily everything that exists is present. But I just argue that non-present events must exist, and so we conclude that presentism must be false. Yeah? Or to put it maybe more correctly, given the contradiction between premise 3 and premise 4, it's not obvious how the presentist is supposed to account for the truth of claims involving such cross-temporal relations. Yeah, claims such as the ones I just written down here. Yeah. Um, now, what is more, given, given the sheer variety and pervasiveness of these cross-temporal relations, the problem of cross-temporal relations has reared its head in, in, in a plethora of ways. And so one specific variation on this cross-temporal theme is the problem of causation. Yeah. So once again, assuming that causes C are always temporally prior to their effects E, all causal relations NCB will be cross-temporally exemplified and will therefore be subject to this problem of cross-temporal relations. Yeah. So here is Leininger's own formulation of the problem. Yeah. She says, the relation here, this causal relation N, is supposed to be a connection. Yeah. Uh, and a connection cannot exist without its relata. So this rules out that N comes into existence when the cause C comes into existence. Because at that point, one of the relata, namely the effect E, does not yet exist. But if N does not exist without E, then N cannot guarantee E's existence. And so the cause, therefore, seems to be able to exist without E necessarily following. Yeah. In the previous slide, uh, I didn't draw the conclusion. 
why, why does it mean presented in this course? I mean, <laughs> I understand the steps, and, uh, but for presentation, I would say obviously, uh, non present events do not exist. <laughs> but it doesn't mean presented is false. Sure, ex but, but the problem, so, so that's what I said, so, so the, 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 more, the more correct way of concluding this would be that there is a challenge here for the presentists because yeah, okay, okay. the presentists will probably want to make yeah. sense of such claims which are, you know, very straightforward, easy yeah. claims to make. And I was going to focus on the yeah. formation. Indeed, okay. and, I, and, and that of course will be a challenge for the presentist in a way that isn't for the eternalist. Yeah. But, but yeah, I fully agree, it doesn't, it doesn't just follow that presentism is false, but it does, it does, it does give them something of a challenge. Um, and so, for example, any causal claim will be a challenge for the president. How to make sense of causal claims um, if there is no way to make sense of this causal relation because it can't exist since one part of, 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 of the relation is, is, is not yet there. It doesn't exist. Good. Um, and so, so, I think that in her paper, Leimer essentially generalizes this problem of causation to the other enforcers. So to laws of nature or to dispositions. And so, so in that way, her coordination problem really is just another variation on the same cross-temporal team. Yeah, but just, just to illustrate it, uh, here's my own formulation of the coordination problem. And so I've left the problem of cross-temporal relations here on the right for comparison's sake. Yeah, so you can see that we start with the same premise. Uh, relations require the existence of their relata. Premise two then says that necessitation relations are cross-temporal and they therefore hold between present and future states of affairs. Uh, it follows from those two premises that future states of affairs must exist. Yet, premise four, if future denials are right, then future states of affairs do not exist, and so Langer concludes future deniers must be wrong. Yeah? Or as she writes in her paper, ultimately, uh, the regular nature of the world demands the postulation of a relationship, call it NFG, between what exists at the present F and what does not G, uh, a relationship that can in principle be supplied given the assumption that relations are existence in the yeah. So let me just go back very quickly to the problem of um, cross-temporal relations. Yeah. Uh, given its generality and, and, and given the fact that it's so well known, uh, there have, of course, been a lot of strategies that have been proposed in order to meet this problem. So I think it's worth checking whether any of those strategies would help us here in trying to answer Leibniz's coordination problem. Yeah. Now, any future denier will want to retain premise 4 for obvious reasons. Yeah. So the future denier will, will be forced to, to, to answer the coordination problem by either rejecting premise 1, yeah, that is, rejecting the idea that relations um, are existence and daily, or by rejecting premise 2. Yeah, so those would be the two strategies to be entertained. Um, good. Now, so the first um, strategy consists in rejecting premise 1, that is, in denying that relations are existence and tailing. Um, now, due to time constraints, I'm not going to go into this, um, but also for reasons I'm, I'm happy to go into maybe later on during the Q&A, but basically my fear is that this strategy is going to lead us to some form of Menonianism, which is a position I, I have difficulties accepting just like this. Um, so what I want to do for this talk is to actually entertain a second strategy, that is rejecting premise two by denying that necessitation relations are across them. And now, admittedly, at first sight, this strategy may not seem much more promising than the first, mm -hmm. because after all, if, if the game here is to is to answer the coordination problem um, by explaining how um, past and present regularities can persist in the future through the introduction of these necessary connections, then clearly those necessitation relations will have to be cross-temporal. They will have to link the present states of affairs to a future state of affairs. Yeah. And yet I believe there is a way out of the cross-temporal threat, namely by carefully distinguishing between two kinds of necessitation, and yeah, namely between type-level necessitation and token-level necessitation. And so what I want to do for the remainder of the talk is to apply this distinction to the three kinds of enforcers. It is applying to causal necessitation, nomic necessitation, and metaphysical necessitation. Yeah. 
um, for necessitation due to causation, due to the rules of nature, and due to the dispositions in the world. Okay. Um, good. Let me start with causal necessitation. So the key to solving the causal coordination problem, I maintain, is this distinction between two kinds of causation, uh, which, which actually occur at two different ontological levels. So there is time-level causation and, and there is token-level causation. Yeah. Um, now, token-level causation, such as CX causing EX, um, in that case, you can see that the causal relation NCX EX holds between a token cause and a token effect. Yeah. Uh, an example here could be flicking the light switch in my kitchen um, causes the kitchen light to go on. Yeah. With type level causation, the causal relation NCE holds between a type cause C and a type effect E. So the example here would be flicking light switches very generally causes lights to go on. Um, now, what is important is that token causes and token effects are particular events. Yeah. It's me flicking the, the, the switch in my kitchen. It's my kitchen light switch uh, going on. And so because they are particular events, they can be located in both space and time, yeah, as I've indicated here. And so assuming that causes are temporally prior to their effects, um, token level causal relations uh, will always be cross-temporal and they will link a present cause to a future effect. Yeah. Now, type causes and type effects, on the other hand, are kinds of events. And because kinds of events can have multiple different instances, um, they, they cannot be located in space and time. And so the type level causal relations, NCE, will therefore fail to be spatio-temporal. It can actually best be told of in, in, in atemporal terms. It's more of an atemporal relation. Yeah. Finally, time-level causation and token-level causation are not independent. Yeah. Now, which kind of causation is more fundamental than the other is, is, is very much open for a debate. But what I want to argue is that if, if the aim here is to avoid the threat of cross-temporality, then we will have to argue that time level causation is more fundamental than token level causation. Yeah? That is, we will have to argue that somehow time level causation is ontologically prior to token level causation. Now, or to put it even more specifically, we will have to argue that the presence of a causal relation on the token level um, obtains in virtue of a much more general connection on the time level. Yeah. That is, CX here causes EX in virtue of C causing E. Yeah. So how does this answer Leininger's coordination problem? Well, first of all, note that, that in her paper, Leininger doesn't make this distinction between the time and the token level. Yeah. And this is particularly obvious in the quote I just showed you before on the problem of causation. As you can see, um, Leininger systematically writes C and E um, for the token causes and the token effects rather than CX and EX. And that she therefore somehow wrongly assumes that these token causes and token effects are populating the same ontological level as this causal relation NCE. And therefore argues that NCE cannot exist as long as both C and E do not exist. But as I just tried to argue, NCE is a relation of the type level, linking type causes to type effects. And so on the assumption that type level causation is ontologically prior to token level causation, this causal relation NCE will hold independently of any spatio-temporal instantiation of that relation at the token level. And so NCE can be used to explain why EX must follow CX when the future comes into existence, thereby answering Leininger's coordination problem. So in other words, um, the cross-temporal problem uh, can be avoided by invoking an atemporal necessitation relation, NCE, at the time level to bring its cross-temporal instantiations at the total level into existence.
Now, a very similar strategy can be used with respect to nomic necessitation. Yeah? So with nomic necessitation, the idea is that there are laws of nature, there are governing laws of nature that govern how the universe will evolve. Um, and it's through the presence of those necessitation relations that we, that we can explain why the past and present regularities will persist in the future. Now, the standard governing account of laws was independently developed by Dretsky, Thule, and Armstrong. It's therefore referred to as the DTA account of laws. Yeah. So just as a very brief uh, refresher of this account, um, according to DTA, a regularity of the form of all FSRGs will be a law of nature if and only if F and G are universal. So this F and G must be properties that can be multiply instantiated. Uh, and secondly, a nomic necessitation relation and should hold between those universals F and G. Yeah? And so this state of affairs is then typically symbolized as NFG. Yeah, so to give you an example, uh, all humans are immortal. Uh, will is, it, is, is considered to be a law of nature on the DTA account because first of all, uh, being human and being mortal are universals. That are properties that can be multiply instantiated. And secondly, a nomic necessitation relation N is supposed to hold between these universals F and G. Yeah. So according to DTA then, whenever a particular object X instantiates the property F, the instantiation of F that is Fx guarantees via this nomic necessitation relation that the property G will also be instantiated, namely Gx. Good. And so what is important here once again is that Fx and Gx are tokens. Yeah? They are particular states of affairs, that is, they are particular instances of a universal. Now, X here could be any person who happens to instantiate the property of being human or who happens to instantiate the property of being mortal. Um, and as such, they can be located in both space and time. Yeah? Um, whereas F and G here, on the other hand, are types. They're, 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 um, they're types of states of affairs, and they're universals, which can be multiply instantiated. Uh, the, the property redness can be multiply instantiated. And so you can't, therefore, localize the property of redness in spatial temporal terms. Now, since the nomic necessitation relation NFG links the universal F to the universal G rather than Fx to Gx, N itself here fails to be spatial temporal. Yeah? The different instantiations of NFG at the token level, that is NFx, Gx, on the other hand, are cross temporal. Yeah? Uh, so Armstrong, for example, takes them to be cases of singular causation. Um, where fx at one time is causally connected to gx at a later time. Yeah. Finally, um, by postulating this nomic necessitation relation nfg on, uh, at the type level as opposed to at the token level, DTA at least seemed to suggest that the type level is ontologically prior to the token level. Uh, we'll have to come back to this in just a moment, but th at least that is what seems to follow from the DTA account. Um, and in that case, Fx cross temporally necessitates Gx in virtue of F a temporally necessitating G at the time level. Yeah? So just as with causal necessitation, the cross temporal problem here can be avoided by carefully distinguishing between these two kinds of necessitation at two different levels time and token level necessitation. So, yeah. So just to conclude your argument being that it's not possible to be human on the future denial. Sorry, can you see can you yeah. repeat it? In the previous slide you had some uh, conclusion. If you are human, can you be presentist or eternalist or so it seemed to be only a problem if you are human and uh, and a future denial. Because if, if you are human, you won't accept this idea of causation. Yeah. It so in that case, the linear argument will hold. I think, I think for the human, the problem just does the rise. It's because the human is just not going to agree with Leininger that you need to explain this continuing regularity. No one's yeah, yeah, so it's first, it's point one. That's point that one. Yeah, your point two was 
for the non-human, yeah. indeed, the non-human who, who believes in, in, in the existence of necessary connections, whether it is due to causation, uh, being somehow ontologically fundamental or laws of nature or dispositions, will face this kind of coordination problem, but I think can avoid it by going via the time level, yeah, by, by taking the atemporal route, uh, thereby avoiding this kind of cross-temporal problem. And that's, that's the claim. Um, but, but I think, and then this is leading to, to, the, to the more uh, uh, wild ideas that I, that I need to defend here, um, it is going to lead to some kind of form of Platonism. Yeah? Um, and so, so, so there, is, there is a final problem. And, and, and I think the problem actually becomes particularly salient when, when you consider Armstrong's specific developments of the DTA account. There are differences, of course, between Gretzky, Thule, and Armstrong. It's, it's particularly in Armstrong's case that, 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 that we're going to face an important problem. Um, so let me try to briefly explain. So, so part of Armstrong's metaphysic is the Aristotelian claim that universals are somehow imminent. And by this he means that states of affairs such as fx are ontologically prior to the universal's f. Yeah? Or to put it very pictorially, when God created uh, the world, he first had to create the states of affairs before he could create the different universals. Now contrast this with the Platonic claim according to which universes are not imminent, but transcendent, meaning that universals are ontologically prior to the states of affairs, and just the opposite thesis. Finally, notice that Armstrong's imminence thesis actually entails the so-called principle of instantiation. And it says uh, there can be no uninstantiated universals. Yeah? For the universal F here to exist, there must be at least one instance of that universal world that is one state of affairs, fx. Yeah. Or as Armstrong writes, uh, a property must be a property of some real particular. Yeah. Or again, similarly, a relation must hold between real particulars. Yeah. For the relation being in front of to exist, there needs to be at least one instance of two particulars that are standing in that relation to one another. Yeah. And so what I want to argue is that the solution I just proposed to the nomic coordination problem is going to be incompatible with Armstrong's imminence thesis and will actually force us to accept a platonic ontology of universals according to which the universes are transcendent. Okay? So let me try to briefly explain why I think this is the case. So imagine that fx here presently exists. Yeah? Then by the principle of instantiation, the universal f also exists. And now the question is, why does Gx invariably follow um, Fx? And clearly, I mean, um, trying to invoke this nomic necessitation relation Nfg here is going to be problematic for Armstrong. Because if Gx is in the future, then Gx does not exist for the future denier. And so by the principle of instantiation, the universal G also doesn't exist. And so given the assumption that relations are existence and tailing, NFG cannot exist, and so NFG cannot be used to explain why Gx follows Fx. Yeah. Um, and so it seems that the only way out, I mean, there are a couple of, of you could try to wiggle yourself out of this problem in, in, in a couple of different ways, uh, and I'm happy to go into this during the discussion. Um, but basically, they will all be rather desperate moves, and, and, and in the end, they're going to lead to nowhere, and they, they won't be able to solve this problem. And so what I think um, we should do here is to give up on the principle of instantiation. So we should give up uh, Armstrong's imminence thesis, and instead adopt the transcendence thesis, according to which the universals F and G are transcendent. Yeah, and by this, I mean those universals somehow exist in platonic heaven, and they do so independently of their instantiations in the concrete world. Yeah? And so since F and G can happily live in Platonic heaven, obviously the nomic necessitation relation NFG exists, and so it can be used to explain why GX follows FX, even though GX does not yet exist. Yeah? Um, good. Coming towards the end of my talk, very briefly, how does this um, 
idea applied to metaphysical necessitation. Yeah? So that there was one last way for the future denier to, to try to explain the continuing regularity of the world. And, and that was through dispositions, not rules of nature, not positions, but dispositions. Um, and so briefly, uh, dispositions are, are typically characterized in terms of their causal behavior. So you will say that an object can have the disposition D to display a certain manifestation M when it is triggered by the right kind of stimulus S. Yeah? Um, for example, a fragile face is said to be disposed to break when struck. And so, typically, um, the, the, the connection between a disposition's stimulus S and its manifestation M will be taken to be one of metaphysical necessitation. Yeah? Such that if the object has the disposition D, then necessarily um, the object must manifest M when triggered S. Yeah. And, and we call it a relation of metaphysical necessitation because the idea is that in all possible worlds, objects with that disposition are so disposed. Yeah. And will always follow S. If S happens presently, M must follow in the future. And the problem, of course, once again, uh, at least Leininger would say, is that if S is happening in the present, then M is in the future, it doesn't exist, and so this relation can't exist, it can't be used to explain the continuing regularity. And the solution, once again, will be the realization that this metaphysical necessitation relation, NSM, is, is, uh, is, is an atemporal necessitation relation at the time level, uh, and not a cross-temporal uh, necessitation relation at the token level. Yeah? And NSM here is, is a second-order relation between universals rather than a first-order relation between uh, states of affairs or between particulars. Yeah? And so NSM can be used to explain the future regularity of the world. Yeah? Uh, and of course, once again, in order for this relation NSM to exist, both S and M as universes have to exist. And so once again, we, we, we better adopt a, pl a platonic ontology of universes according to which those universes just exist in platonic heaven and do not need any instantiation in order to exist. Yeah. Um, and so to conclude, I, I just wanted to link briefly to um, a book that recently um, um, that was recently published by uh, Matthew Tugby. Uh, because in this book, Matthew Tugby actually raises a very similar kind of argument in order to argue for a platonic ontology of properties. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to show the, the similarity here. So, um, so Tugby starts his argument with, with a very central principle about dispositions, yeah. namely the fact that a particular can have a disposition even if it never manifests that disposition. Yeah. So, for example, a vase can be fragile even if it never breaks. Yeah. A sugar cube can be soluble even if it never comes into any contact with water. Yeah. Um, so, as, as, as central and, and uncontroversial as this principle may be, according to Tugby, it leads to a paradox, a paradox of unmanifested dispositions. Because remember, in order to make sense of dispositions, in order to characterize them, uh, we had to invoke this, this, this connection between the stimulus or between the disposition and its manifestation. And so as Tugby writes, an obvious way to account for the connection between a disposition and its manifestation is to appeal to a relation of some sort. The problem, however, is that as soon as the central principle is acknowledged, that is, as soon as you acknowledge that some dispositions will never manifest themselves, then one will be left with cases in which that relation has only one relate. Yeah. And so once again, Tugby certainly wasn't the first to notice this kind of problem. Yet yeah, David Armstrong himself already referred to this problem as the Manonian problem uh, in his book in 1997, yeah, when he wrote that when a particular has an unmanifested power, that a particular cannot be related to the potential manifestation of this power because the instantiation of the relation demands that all its terms exist. And so he concluded we have here a Manonian metaphysics in which actual things are in some way related to non existent things. Now, that's the Manonian problem. And according to Tugby, the solution will be a Platonic position, a Platonic ontology of properties. 
a platonic metaphysics, right, study of properties can help us to resolve the paradox. Yeah? So on, on, on this position, objects have dispositions in virtue of the fact that they instantiate universals which stand in relationships of dispositional directedness with other universals, namely with the manifestation universals. And so these other manifestation universals exist even if they are not instantiated. So the directedness of unmanifested dispositions is secured and allows us to avoid a mysterious Menomian picture of dispositions. Yeah? And so just to compare Armstrong's Menomian problem and Tugby's answer to it with Linear's coordination problem and my answer to it, I think you can see how similar they are. Uh, basically what Linear did was to temporalize the Menomian problem. Yeah. But both start from this Aristotelian claim that there is no M without an X, no universals without at least one instantiation of that universal. And then both will argue that there isn't any MX. Yeah. Um, Linear will argue that there isn't no that there, there isn't an MX because MX is in the future, and so MX doesn't exist. Whereas Armstrong will claim MX doesn't exist because it will never manifest itself. But in any case, if MX doesn't exist, M doesn't exist, and so the relation doesn't exist. And the solution in both cases is the platonic claim that M can exist without instantiation in the concrete world. Yeah. And so to conclude, um, I've, um, I've argued that you can meet Linear's coordination problem in two ways. So by endorsing open future humanism, future deniers can just avoid the coordination problem altogether by simply rejecting the continuing regularity assumption. Or secondly, by endorsing non-humanism, future deniers can actually answer the coordination problem if only they are ready to distinguish time from token level necessitation. Yeah? And for this kind of reply to work, the time level has to be ontologically prior to the token level. Yeah. And so with respect to nomic necessitation, to governing accounts of laws, or to some form of dispositionalism, uh, this will force us to adopt a Platon disposition according to which universals are present. Um, I'm gonna also I'm gonna once again I'm gonna once again break your pointer. Oh, come over here. Lock the spammer off of our YouTube chat. <laughs> Sorry, we got spam in chat. <laughs> must mean, must mean we're, we're getting we're getting big. Um, so uh, yeah, I have. I have questions, uh, but do you want to do you want to take a break or do you want to just roll right into questions? It's up to you. Maybe we can take a two minute break. Two minute break. Cool. Two minute break. Two minute break works for me. Okay.
I'll go first. I'll let myself in. Um, yeah, I have a lot of things that I could ask. Um, okay. Actually, really, this this takes me back. I spent a long time. Actually, my, my undergraduate senior thesis did ex tried to do exactly the same thing, but with space and metaphysics of laws instead okay. of time and metaphysics of laws. Nice. So this takes me way back. Um, I'm going to start with a, like a, just a, a more basic kind of exegetical question because I'm wondering. I mean. The move, basically taking the Armstrong move seems, I guess what I'm doing here is I'm just going to throw shaded lining her a little bit. Taking the Armstrong move to me seems, I mean, it's such a well-known move in metaphysics of laws. I'm a little floored that there's not something about that as a potential way out, that that's not, no, it's really just not noticed in the, in the argument in her paper. Can you can you repeat it? So the the taking the taking the move of, of putting the putting the necessary connection between the universals instead of between the objects. Yeah, yeah. That's just she just doesn't notice that. No. Okay. No. I'm just actually surprised, but that's fine. That happens. That happens to the best of us. Indeed. Yeah. No, she doesn't um, notice that. So okay. I think that's I think that's that's indeed it's just a very straightforward way of, of, of trying to avoid a problem. Okay. <laughs> I think what is more interesting is the is 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 is, is my plea for Platonism. Yeah. That the, even someone like Armstrong, who's very happy to um, to accept the existence of universes, the realness of universes, in being an Aristotelian, um, I, I think he's facing just as much difficulties as Slimeer does. I've always been surprised by the same thing: the idea that yeah, the, the kind of un, the kind of uneasy marriage of full-on heavyweight necessary connections between universals. <clears throat> With an Aristotelian about you know, Aristotelianism about universals. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just those have to be uneasy, uneasy bedfellows. Indeed, indeed. And, um, and 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 I find it surprising that not more has been written on this, or that not more people have actually voiced these kind of arguments. Um, so I mean, there's Matthew Tugby, of course. There's there's Tyler Hildebrandt, who's who's again tried to show that that uh, they're they're. You know, there's inconsistencies in Armstrong's metaphysical. If you take all of the different claims he has, you will end up having contradictions, yeah. especially due to the Zimmerman's thesis um, that universes have to be instantiated. But um, but despite that fact, somehow most metaphysicians are still very happy being Aristotelians, and and, and very few are ready to adopt the Platonist position. So, so that's kind of interesting. Yeah. But yeah, thank you for the talking. I find it much more clear than the article I read of the Thank you. I'm stronger as well because you know, there are all this stuff at this position, but yeah. it's not the article. Sure, yeah, indeed. But that, that's the point that I want to make is that the dispositional uh, way out of the problem mm -hmm. doesn't have to be pessimistic. I don't mind to what uh, I don't know, but I think it's great to the point I made when you said share your article. If you relax the idea that uh, the situation implies existence in the state from one way, and if you allow existence to be a more liberal notion that you can, that thing could exist actually or potentially, mm -hmm. the source of the distinction in this position is in the object that exists presently. So if you're a presentist and dispositionalist, you say that the source of the situation is present, presently existing, and the relation is with potentially existing stuff, and not yeah. actually existing stuff. So in this way, I feel that if you are Liberal about the, what what existence means, uh, allowing existence to be potential existence, and if you take dispositions to uh, be uh, in the source of, uh, to be uh, instantiated by the object existing, you don't have to be platonist. Uh, mm. It's a way out. Yeah. Honest, I think. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I see what you mean. And, and uh, okay. does my clicker work? Okay. Oh, um, <laughs> yes. No, I have to go yeah, that button. And yes, I think it does. No, right. Uh, yeah, it's definitely something I, I need to look into in, in, in more detail because, because I agree this may be a way out. Um, but wait, I think I, I had one slide on this. Wait. Here, here's my worry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With the idea of unrealized possibilities and, and, and why, why I'm not so tempted in, in entertaining that kind of way out. Um, so again, yeah, so, so the, the, the cross-temporal relations are holding between the present and the future events. Both present and future events have to exist for the relation to exist, and, and then the future events are going to say, well, it doesn't work because the future event doesn't exist. 
And so you, I think, are saying something along the lines, well, why not say that future, that the future yeah. exists potentially yeah, as so some kind of unrealized possibility? Uh, it's not yet an actual concrete occurrence, it's just, it's just a, a, a potentiality. Um, and so the two reasons why I'm kind of uneasy with, with, with that strategy is that I think it would, first of all, significantly inflate our ontology in the sense that you would have to accept the existence of every possible uh, unrealized possibility. Yeah. Um, um, not every bit are constrained by the disposition that you have right now. The space of possibility is, is defined by the decision that you have instantiated in the presence. So it's not like every yeah. rest of constraints. Yeah, sure. So you would, you would constrain it just by the nature of the dispositions. Yeah, that the, the space of possibility is defined by the decision that you have in the presence. Yeah, 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 fair enough. Um, And, and, and I agree, I mean, in the sense I'm inflating my ontology as well in going the Platonist route and, and, and having to invoke Platonic heaven um, to, to, to find a way out of it. The other, the, the maybe more serious problem is that if you're ready to accept the existence of, of unrealized possibilities, then, then I think as Lewis already showed in, in, in his book, um, those real possibilities can actually ground most of your modal claims, uh, and so you can make sense of counterfactuals, etc., etc. Um, and so, if they can act as the, the truth makers for all these modal truths, then I then it's no longer clear to me what explanatory work there is left for the irreducible dispositions to do. And I think that's the reason why a dispositionalist is not going to be happy uh, to just accept the existence of these unrealized possibilities, because because in a sense, a dispositionalist wants wants the dispositions to be. Uh, the, the fundament of their ontology and to do the heavy work here in, in, in being the truth makers. So I think I think there is some kind of tension. Maybe if you're not a dispositionalist, um, then then this could very well be a, a position to 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 adopt here. Yeah. Uh, it's true that it's a weakness of disposition usually. Is, uh, most of the time, they don't explain much as much as they describe stuff. Yeah. So I uh, agree it's weakness yeah. of disposition usually. Yeah. 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 But it's a good point, and it's definitely one that I need to explore for this. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, sure. Yeah, you didn't speak, you didn't discuss point one, strategy. Yeah. And when you explained Leibniz's arguments, that was the first objection that raised my mind. I find that, I don't know, personally, I, I find it a bit weak to say that a relationship only exists if the data exists. And we can take a very basic example. If I say tomorrow is going to rain, I, the condition to give this sentence a meaning is to imagine the contrary, like you know, uh, tomorrow it's not going to rain in some way. So it's related to you know, non-actual possibility. Mm -hmm. So it feels like why or, or, or maybe how Leibniz does defend the point that the relata should exist. Maybe you can give. Some more details. Yeah, sure. So, so why does Leininger um, take those necessary connections to be relations uh, between two relata? I'm, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I mean, this is this is just her reading of it, um, which I think is fair enough. Um, but but I agree with you that there are at least two ways out of that uh, by just focusing on this idea that, that the necessary connections have to be a relation. Um, so the first one would be to argue that, um, that for example, when you consider causation where C causes E, um, we're not dealing with causal relations in which there is this kind of connection between C and E, but that you need to think about it in, in non-relational terms, in more productive terms, for example. And so I think there's a lot of accounts um, of causation that, that go this non-relational route. And so that may be a way out. If, if, if you're able to make sense of causation in non-relational terms, then obviously the whole problem here is, is, is not going to occur. So that would be one way of dealing with it. The other way I'm, 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 I'm more skeptical about, and that is, that is why I didn't want to entertain the first strategy, that would be to say, um, yeah, I mean, the causal relation is a relation, um, but it isn't because one of the two relata doesn't exist, and therefore the relation cannot exist. So relations do not have to be existence entailing. Um, 
that I find more difficult to believe because, because that seems to lead to some form of manomianism according to which you would have to um, subscribe to, yeah, to, to, to such things as non-existent objects. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in that case you're, you're linking an existing object to a non-existing object. Uh, that, that, seems, that seems strange. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think it depends how you define existence in some way. But for instance, yeah. if I understand the law of physics, I can uh, produce some counterfactual uh, example. For instance, if I would, if uh, light speed would be different, mm -hmm. okay, the world would be different too. So it seems pretty usual in order to understand mm -hmm. the actual world mm -hmm. to make necessity relationship about yeah. the actual world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but okay, maybe in some case uh, we say okay, light light exists in some way, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so we are speaking about an existing object, yeah. uh, but in a non-existing world, yeah. maybe we make a relationship between something that exists. We change the speed. Okay, the sp can we say speed exists? Okay, so you, you understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what mean. does it mean existence? I think everything is contained in this in this very basic concept. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And, so, and, and of course, I mean, this this isn't something that needs tackling just here. It, it's basically at the heart of a lot of the discussions and debates between presentists and the eternists because they basically disagree on what exists. Yeah. Um, obviously, they, they both agree that dinosaurs do not exist right now, but they don't agree on whether dinosaurs exist simpliciter. Um, and so the yeah. presentists somehow um, will 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 yeah will, will, will no longer quantify over over the past and and, and the future events and so his ontology is somehow more restricted it's three dimensional whereas the returns it's four dimensional but 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 it's 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 surprisingly hard to make clear sense of, of those distinctions and, and it actually has led to a, a whole bunch of papers by people such as Deeks I think uh, Dorato and some others who actually ended up saying that there actually isn't any fundamental difference between a presentist and the eternist. Actually, if you look closely enough at what they are both claiming, there's no disagreement at all. Mm -hmm. Because there are so many ways of interpreting the word exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you interpret it temporally, atemporally, only temporally? Uh, I mean, and so, so, yeah, I agree. Things get very confusing there. And, and, and I think you can you see, you see exactly the same here. Yeah, yeah. In a, in a way, when I say there is nothing existing outside my mind, for instance, mm -hmm. we are turning to some debates. It's maybe reasonable to say we cannot prove it or mm -hmm. uh, counter-prove it. Yeah. And so I wonder if at least it's not the same kind of phenomenon that happened here. You know, yeah. we cannot just say dinosaur doesn't exist because nothing exists outside of my mind. My mind is present. You know? And so I, I have this feeling that at the very end of the debate, we enter into a kind of non decidable statement about does it, is it true that the world exists outside my mind? Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if people could just agree if we make some economy on, in the way we, 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 we state the, the, the issue. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so and I do think once you use the word existence, yeah. you can very easily make people disagree. But yeah, if sure. you are a bit more clear, sure. we just accept, okay, this is indecidable, okay, you accept it, I don't. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, we, we don't need to say a uh, future doesn't exist, you know. <laughs> yeah. We just try to understand what are the non decidable states. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then again, I, I, think, I think it's more than just uh, uh, coming from. from, from what we mentally mentally think. I mean, the, the presentist, I think, is driven by, by by intuitions most of us will share about time. Yeah? We all feel stuck in the present, and and we all feel as if we are have some some kind of freedom to to shape the future. So, so the future is still open. I mean, it, it, it's still to be realized, and and and, and so. Uh, we all feel as if we're moving towards the future at a certain speed, you know, on average one second per second. Uh, so there is this flow of time. Uh, all of those are very intuitive feelings and, 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 and the presentist wants to take them seriously. 
and 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 will therefore argue that that yeah that, that the world or what exists must be limited to the present moment only, and that that moment must change with time as time passes. Um, so they are trying to, to to somehow make sense of, of the notion of temporal becoming of the idea that only the present exists, that the past and future don't exist, um, and, and and of of real change. Yeah, because in the block universe, you could argue that there there isn't like a real substantial change, it's just a variation over time, but, but what, what the rest is what's, what's more than that. So I think all of these things are very much happening in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there is, too, I, I, I'm, I'm not persuaded by the arguments by Deeks and Dorato that there, there isn't any disagreement here between presidents and theorists. I, th I think they really have uh, very different claims, very different intuitions for sure. Uh, and, and I think the simplest way just to see this is, is indeed by, by, by looking at what, what's their ontology. But the one who subscribe to a three-dimensional world that just stretches out in space, and, and the eternist will, 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 will also take the temporal dimension into consideration and make it four-dimensional. So I mean, those are clearly fundamentally different ontologies. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, I agree. It, it, it becomes vague and difficult and hard once you ask the question, yeah, but what do you mean when you say that the future is real, or the future is not real, or the past exists, or it doesn't exist. And, yeah, those are those are yeah. difficult, difficult terms, and, and they aren't being spelled out enough or at all in, in most of the literature on the philosophy of time. Mm -hmm. Very few authors have actually tried to to make more sense of these things. And I, and I think that leads to a lot of confusion and a lot of a lot of problems here. So you should start. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> True. No, I think we really need it because yeah. I mean, except that if you are already into the debate and, and and so you feel like it's very easy to understand because you are in, and mm -hmm. that happened to me at the end of the presentation. Yeah. But it never changed the fact that at the very beginning I'm like it doesn't mean nothing because mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. what do we mean? Yeah. So it's like I, I've been yeah. brainwashed yeah. and I feel yeah. <laughs> confident yeah. I about see what the you thing mean. I manipulate. Yeah. But uh, initially, I'm uh, just lost, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the same with a lot of, uh, maybe in physics, uh, the same phenomenon. We don't know what does it mean. Oh, there's a theoretical term. And, but after a while, we get used You kind of get a feeling for it, yeah, indeed. <laughs> indeed. Get, yeah. Yeah. So it would be useful. And, um, so and I have also this feeling that maybe we can defend without being Platonist, but Stating something, a kind of as if, you know, but I don't know if it, if it, it will hold. For instance, yeah. let's say I'm a human and blockist, and I, and, I, and I state the future doesn't exist, but the only way I can understand the world is reasoning as if it was Platonist, even mm -hmm. if it's not at all. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So I can make relations which are not low because I'm a yeah. human, yeah. but I can make pseudo relation in a pseudo Platonist yeah. way yeah. in order to understand the yeah. possibility for the future. Yeah. So I don't know if this will hold. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, we'd have to think about it. I mean to me that definitely is the more interesting question that that, that somehow came out of this this little project. Um, namely, yeah, should we be a Platonist? Or, or or is this to me to me this seems to suggest that that if you are driven by non-human convictions, yeah, if, 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 if you take the idea of laws governing the universe really seriously, uh, if you want the laws to dictate, if you want them to rule, then, then, then Platonism is, is by far the best, maybe the only position to adopt. Uh, and that to me is very interesting because, because once again, uh, uh, most metaphysicians today whether someone like Armstrong who has a governing account of rules in mind or people like Bird or Ellis or Mumford who are much more dispositionalist, if they are going to be realists about universals, they will be Aristotelians. There are very, very few Platonists around. And, and um, that to me comes, comes, as, yeah, comes as, as somewhat of a surprise because, because I can see how Platonism Fits much better with, with these kind of convictions than, than Aristotle. Well, it's one thing that, that I thought was really interesting in the talk because it, that other other thing that it reminded me of uh, is, for all that now it is, 
I would say most often used as a contribution to the debate over non-causal explanation, we often tend to forget that um, Brown, right? the, uh, the first paper about, uh, about the cicadas and prime number explanation uh, is intended to be a defense of Platonism yeah. at the end of the day, right? He, yeah. he cares about, I've actually, I've actually been to dinner with him once, he came, to, he came to LSU one time while I was teaching there, and he was like, yeah, I always find it really weird that like, I'm a philosopher of science now, because I'm a philosopher of math. Yeah. Like, I wrote that paper because I think people don't care enough about Platonism. That was the whole reason. And I think something that's kind of interesting here, I, I almost, it, it, it's funny, you know, one event could be random, but two starts to look like a trend. Um, you know, it's interesting to see these, this idea that, that maybe the right way to approach this is not to just get neck deep in questions about numbers or universals, purely speaking, um, but to see what kinds of consequences uh, adopting that position has for other stuff that you might be more interested in, or for that matter, which I think is a self, because this gets to some of what, uh, of what Gwena was saying, uh, places where you might have clear intuitions, yeah. right? Where you're, I mean, where, where you don't just wind up foundering over, um, yeah, what, how exactly you feel like interpreting what it means yeah. to say that the past doesn't have any present existence. Um, you might, have, you might feel like you have a little bit more traction over, so what's the right way to understand laws? We at least have a lot more literature on that. At least we can make some appeals to scientific practice somehow mm -hmm. um, that might help. Yeah. Um, and I think, that's, I think this is a, it's just a, it's a cool idea in general. Like, I'll be interested to see if this, if this trend continues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I have to preface my comment by saying that I'm way, way out of my area of competence, but uh, I was uh, thinking about uh, the relationship between uh, the type uh, level uh, uh, relations and the token level relational distinction on the one hand, and uh, Platonist uh, uh, metaphysics on the other hand. And I'd say that there might be a quote-unquote quasi-Hegelian alternative to of Platonist metaphysics that uh, could uh, be used to uh, understand this uh, frame, understand this uh, relationship, uh, the distinction between uh, type and uh, type relations and token level relations. Because, for instance, we could uh, uh, state that uh, uh, the token level relations obtained in, uh, in virtue of uh, type level uh, the existence of uh, type level uh, relations, mm -hmm. but that uh, at the same time type level relations supervene over the existence of a certain set of uh, uh, a certain arrangement a ser of uh, a certain uh, set of states of affair that uh, uh, are, uh, are at the same ontological level as a uh, uh, token uh, uh, level relations and to give an example for instance we can uh, um, we can state that uh, uh, we can explain the fact that an apple falls from a tree as a relation as a uh, relations between as uh, the instantiation of a relation between uh, uh, the mass of the apple and the mass of the earth and this relation is gravitational attraction and this uh, token level relation between the, uh, the, the mass of the earth and the mass of the apple obtained in virtue of the existence of a more general relation that's described by Newton's uh, sure. law but at the same time the existence of Newton's law if I'm not mistaken presupposes the existence of a certain uh, general uh, state of affair uh, of the universe uh, state of affairs which is the post big bang universe and uh, uh, we cannot know whether uh, there exists in some such a thing as a type uh, level relation similar to uh, uh, those described by uh, Newton's laws in the pre Big Bang universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, 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 for for me that that. 
that is exactly the reason why I have my doubts about the Aristotelian position. Because it seems to me that we are turning in circles here, um, and, and that this may be something of a, of a dangerous circle. So, so I'm, I'm not familiar enough with, with, with Hegel uh, to see how this may help. But I think with, with, with the Aristotelian conception of, of universals, that, that exactly is the problem. Um, I don't know if it works. Uh, yeah, so, 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 so as I tried to explain here, and, and I think this was exactly what you were trying to argue for, um, I think that this Aristotelian conception where the universes are imminent in space and time isn't stable for exactly that reason, because if they are imminent, then they, as you said, somehow ontologically depend upon the very sequences that they are supposed to explain. And so the question would be, how can something explain or determine the very things on which it ontologically depends? Yeah. Or in the case of dispositions, how can dispositions in the concrete world inherit their dispositional directedness from the universes they instantiate if those universes are ontologically dependent uh, on their instantiations. Yeah, it, 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 there's this, this, this funny circularity here that, that makes me feel very uneasy about the Aristotelian conception. Um, but, and, and I think it's been raised, I think Armstrong has struggled with it, I think Armstrong has tried to make sense of it, but not very successfully. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think it's been raised very much or enough, and so I'm surprised Aristotelian. That I'm surprised that there are still so many Aristotelians, given this kind of tension. So, so, so maybe I'm missing something here. Maybe there are some. Yeah. It seems, it seems connected. Yeah. I have a question coming in from Peter, by the way. Okay. Yeah, but I believe it's because the project of Aristotelian metaphysics is not so much explicationist as it is descriptive and trying to capture the things that better describe the world and better explain the world. So. The same as saying that expedition is that if you want to make sense of a practice or something, you will uh, posit that the better way to take into account what the practice is doing is this position because that's the thing that uh, resonates the world the best. But it's not explanation in the sense that you need an explanation in, the, in science. Uh, actually, uh, I've seen some papers that are criticizing this uh, okay. trend of trying to think that that is what explains stuff and not trying to uh, find the the best uh, presentation that fits the best uh, thing that mm -hmm. I've been done. So mm -hmm. I think the project is more descriptive than the reflection mm -hmm. or but, you, but would you say that, that people like Bird or Mumford aren't taking their project to be... Maybe they're not taking it to be, but uh, mm -hmm. in the end that's what, 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 what Finnish being is. This mm -hmm. kind of, when, when you read some taco or some logo or the, uh, the most uh, the biggest proponent of uh, Einstein metaphysics, yeah. the way they describe, they describe what, what they are doing is that they are pretty much doing the description of what, what, what's happening. Yeah. By just that they are trying to explain to expand that into modal reality and uh, yeah, potential yeah. way the world is, but it's not explication of what the, why the world is like that. It's yeah. a description of what the world could be. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks for that. Yeah. Follow? Yeah, I have a look on the relation between uh, immanence and uh, ontological dependency. Yeah. So, uh, and, and the explanatory problem. Because I'd say that one solution might be to say that, uh, to, s to argue that, well, sorry, I have to say that uh, I don't know uh, enough uh, cosmology to really argue the point, but I might suggest that we could argue that, uh, uh, um, for instance, Physi physical type, uh, uh, sorry, physical token level relations depend, ontologically depend on uh, uh, type level, uh, uh, type uh, level uh, uh, physical uh, relations, mm -hmm. but that this dependency is uh, 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 relative to uh, a particular macro state of the universe, uh, for instance, uh, which would be the post Big Bang state of the universe, and in this sense, uh, this uh, ontological dependency of uh, 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 token level relations to uh, uh, sorry from to type. Uh, uh, to, to type level relations 
is uh, uh, the, a product of the history of the universe, and that is itself temporal. This ontological dependency is itself temporal. Yeah, I would have to think about it. In any case, I, I don't take Armstrong yeah. to be. I don't think he has that in mind when 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 he subscribes to to the imminence thesis. I mean, our yeah, yeah. No, so so yeah. Thank you for that, but uh, I, I would have to think about it. Uh, the one thing that is clear from Armstrong is that. Um, he is an eternalist for obvious reasons. He, he kind of needs to be an eternalist, but uh, not to run too quickly in any of those struggles, for example, with unmanifested dispositions. And so, given that Armstrong takes past, present, and future events to exist, it's, it's sufficient for him that, um, that some manifestation token has occurred somewhere in the past or with a person or in the future for the universal to exist and in order to be able to use those second order relations between the universals. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure how that would connect with what you just said. Yeah, thank you. Question coming in from Peter. Uh, who says, uh, nice talk, thanks. Uh, thank small you. clarification question. Um, what are the FX and the GX really supposed to be? So are they events? Are they states of affairs? Are they individuals having properties, etc.? Does that and does the answer to that question have any impact on your conclusions, for example, about the dispositionalist solution? Yeah. So there's a first question. He has another. Oh, he has another one. Uh, yeah, thanks. I I don't know if that would have any consequences for the argument I just gave. I, I think in my paper I framed it in terms of states of affairs because 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 I was basically engaging with Armstrong, who is of course very happy to to, to use that kind of language. So in that case, it's it's really a particular instantiating a universal. Uh, so so the X instantiating the property of Fness, and, and then that is taken to be a state of affairs. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that someone like Matthew Tugby. Uh, isn't talking in terms of states of affairs and then we talking any of the other ways. But I, I don't see how that would affect the argument. I don't think it would make a fundamental difference to the argument we just raised. Yeah. Um, and I'll, of course, if you want to follow up, Peter, I'm, I'm still looking at teams. Um, other question, and this I think is related to, to, Kevin's, uh, to Kevin's question from earlier as well. So yeah, could it be a way out for the present just that future events only exist in some other possible world? Yeah. And yeah, that comes back to that. Yeah, yeah. So that's really related to that. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's definitely enough for you to be explored here. Um, if, if, if you want to avoid uh, Platonism, of course. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, while we wait for, for uh, Peter to maybe have a follow-up, um, I have one more, this is, this is much more speculative, um, but when you Talk about ontological priority between uh, objects and relations. Yeah. This immediately makes me think about structural realism. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, all those guys are eternalists for reasons that I mean, check out with the rest of their neo-Aristotelian metaphysics. Yes. Like, cool, like, 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 fine. Are there well, post neo-Aristotelian mm -hmm. rejection of neo-Aristotelian, but hanging on to those bits of neo-Aristotelian mm -hmm. metaphysics. Um, Could it, I guess one thing, this is, this is the, the best way I can think of to frame this is, could there potentially be a way out here to explore, would it be enough to just invert the priority relation? I guess maybe that's the right thing yeah. for me to say. Does that suffice? I feel like the answer is no, because you still have a problem if the relata totally don't exist at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Good question. I don't know. I, no idea. But that was because I mean I remember having I remember having I did a uh, very early on in the structural in the OSR days we did a graduate yeah. we did a graduate reading group when I was at when I was in, in, in getting my PhD with uh, with Catherine Brady and we were all standing around the blackboard one day and it was just like you know how do you reject that you know 
first order logic, R, X, Y entails there's an X, in there, or R, A, B entails there's an A and there's a B. Um, and it feels sometimes like they have to make that move. But then that's one of the moves that I think is the hardest to understand yeah, in that yeah, whole yeah. corpus anyway. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and in, in, I mean, in reading up for this talk, I, I, I ended up reading some papers on structural realism and then. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I'm pretty sure some people have played with accepting those IDs. I'm not sure whether it was Neil Durar or some others, but so, yeah, there's definitely stuff there. Um, yeah. But no idea how to <laughs> any of this. I mean, it, 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 to me, that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've got to wrap my mind around it, but, but yeah, why not? I mean, the phrase of the paper where I spell it straight away, so this question where it's saying that you object in the structure of interdependence. So it's not that the structure is the okay. same but it defines the object the same way as the object defines okay. structure. And so you could have taken it to a But that, that may go even towards, towards what you were trying to claim. It, it seems like you, you, you were putting them all on the same ontological level. Isn't it? If, if, if you're going to... Well, the same, well uh, not really, but... Uh, uh, Let's say, I'd say that uh, the relations between those two ontological levels, levels need to be understood uh, uh, from a temporal standpoint. Okay, okay, yeah, no, so that would be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah there's no, it's, it's metaphysical dependence, not time for yeah, the structural yeah, 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 yeah. 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 something like grounding. Yeah, yeah, interesting. yeah you can send me this paper, so that would be interesting to, to look at. Checking if there's anything else online. I don't see anything. Great. All right. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>